Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I remember when I got this uh, invitation from uh, Natalie. I said, gosh, the, the economy at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Are you sure? She said, yes, thank because you. we know that you're made of stern stuff at the Clifton Festival. And it is, of course, uh, one of the most pressing issues that we face uh, in Britain and beyond as we come, very hopefully, out of the pandemic or take our, our steps out of it. And so we brought together a fantastic panel this morning to look at where we are now in terms of what is described as Operation Phoenix, rise from the, uh, the ashes of the crisis, but also perhaps a bit of a reality check on where uh, the UK is in terms uh, of the economy. So sitting next to me, someone you might recognise from uh, around and about at, at Clifton, is Ian Livingstone, who's our host at this uh, festival, Natalie. In this uh, context, however, Ian, it's no fear, no favours, because he is certainly here to talk about the economy as someone who has built businesses in, I think I'm right to say, 20 countries right. and active in 12. So it keeps him a bit busy uh, in the early part of the day. Um, but also it gives you a fantastic um, platform to, to look across labour shortages, supply chains, and some of the, the subjects I'm sure we'll come to when we, we talk about uh, what the UK needs to address. He's, he's always described as, as shy and retiring. So I love having someone on a panel who's always described as shy and retiring. Because you just know when you read that, he probably isn't. <laughs> Dan Pizzavoy, I've uh, known for many years, is uh, one of the most acclaimed speakers uh, on the international circuit as well as in the UK. She is a global economist and strategist. She has uh, written a book, which is probably on the table in front of her, called How Boards Work, which I, uh, I think taking everything back to basics with a very clear eye, and a clear eye for the way that countries and economies interact is Dambisa's great strength. So we're going to hear from her uh, in the moment after Ian, in terms of perhaps putting where dear old blighty and its uh, economic <laughs> outlook sits and, uh, and in the international prism. And Mervyn King, uh, many of you will recognise at the far end of the panel. For me, former governor of the Bank of England during a, a small event known as the International Financial Crisis. Um, he has always, I think, been a steady and clarifying uh, uh, eye on the economy in the UK. Not all of his thoughts, including uh, on Brexit and likely fallout from Brexit, align with some of his successors uh, and central banker orthodoxy, so we might touch uh, on that if we could, Mervyn, in his book. is called Radical Uncertainty, which seems like a pretty good description of where we are uh, at the end of 2021. So we thought, what we thought we would do is the panel will give us a, a short sort of splurge on what their view is right now. The British economy... Triumph, disaster, somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so where are we at the moment? We are post-Brexit. We are post-pandemic. We're starting to grow um, out of the difficult situation that we've had. Um, and I'm quite worried because I'm not sure that the government's really engaged with the private sector. Um, you know, I read headlines time and time again about how industry is, is not being listened to by the government. And the concern that I've got is that we are facing supply shortages, we're, sub, we're facing labor shortages, we're facing inflation, and I don't really see where the growth is coming from. I don't think we have a strategic plan in terms of our business sector. I don't see how the growth is going to happen. Um, I think post-Brexit, we were looking at the sort of Singapore on Thames model, maybe wistfully, maybe it was a, a, a romantic notion that we could be a low tax, uh, high efficiency, high skilled economy. But what we've actually got is the highest tax take in 50 years. We've got a government that's not engaged with the private sector. Um, and the bureaucracy, as far as I can see, is rising and rising, not getting less. We were promised a bonfire of red tape, and it just hasn't happened. In fact, what we've had is ever-increasing rises in taxation, ever-increasing levies, green levies, this and the other. We all know that we've got to address the, you know, the fundamental green problems in the economy, but not at the cost of jobs in the short term. This country needs growth. 
We need it quickly. We don't need more bureaucracy. We need to clear a way for companies and businesses to thrive. Governments don't create jobs. People, businesses do. And, and we need to be given the oxygen to do that. And I don't feel that we've got it. I don't think the government's listening. I don't think there's any joined up thinking between government departments. I constantly get told, well, governments work <coughs> in silos. Well, it's about time they didn't work in silos. It's about time they put their heads together and came up with some coherent plans to get us out of the mess that we're in. And if I were just to add uh, one thought or mild challenge to that, I work for The Economist. We're often rather kind of bearish, really, about it. UK economy, particularly after Brexit, but we did have a piece very recently saying actually Britain has come faster out of uh, the doldrums of the pandemic than many expected. Uh, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak has money uh, to play with, it, 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 which is just as well because Boris keeps spending it really, whether Rishi wants to or not. Um, but so, yeah, just in terms of, I could see that you think that the government machine and the way that the sort of the, the statecraft might not, mm. not be what you want it to be, but if you look in your business across the fundamentals, do you think that the economist's prognosis is, is right, that we're, I, you know, we do have opportunity? I see in our business uh, huge restrictions in growth. I think that we, what we've had is a sort of a, an injection of, of, of heroin in terms of, of lots of cheap and free money being pumped into the economy, and that's going to stop. So where are we when that stops? We can't grow our businesses because we don't have the staff and we don't have the supply chain. So we have to get the workforce back. There's something like a million job vacancies. There's 150,000 in hospitality alone. There's hundreds of thousands in manufacturing and distribution and teaching and care industries. Everyone's short of staff. What is the government doing? What is the plan to get people back to work? That's UK people. It's about skills and it's about allowing on a demand basis, it's about allowing immigration back into the country. And unfortunately, political expediency post-Brexit has dictated that we're not allowing anybody in. And, and that's a disaster. Right. Well, there's not, not much doubt about where you stand on that one. <laughs> <laughs> the hotline to number 10 right now. Uh, Dan, Dan, listening yeah. to that, it'll be interesting whether you, uh, you share that, uh, that kind of mode that, that Ian has, has set us uh, into about the problems ahead. And, but um, you know, give us a bit of cheer, put us in an international context uh, oh gosh, as well. I'm not sure that. Uh, so are, we, you know, are we alone <laughs> in, in having these problems to yeah. this extent, or do you, are you seeing some patterns as you start to travel around the world again and uh, address audiences? So um, I think just in terms of uh, perhaps delineating the, my contribution from what I imagine uh, Lord King will be saying and what Ian's saying, I'd like to put the growth question of the UK in a broader global context. Because um, I think very often it's very tempting to sort of go down the rabbit hole of where we are here and now, and which is critically important for where we're going. But I would like to just take us back a little bit um, to, uh, to 2019, before the pandemic hit in earnest. Um, and um, for people who are economists in the room, um, the rule of thumb that I'm using, and I'm glad that uh, Ian mentioned the word growth, I think it's really at the core of this issue. I know that there are probably some millennials in the room who are very anti-growth, and we, we can talk about that later. But fundamentally, without growth, we're not going to get improvements in living standards. We won't be able to pay for public goods. We won't get innovation. Um, and arguably, we won't even be able to have a competitive democratic process that actually can, can stand the test of time um, come, come hell and high water. So fundamentally, it's all is just assume that growth is critical. We need to have 3% per year um, in order to double per capita incomes in a generation. A generation is 25 years. Um, and that's just the rule of 72. So we need to have 3% growth. Before the pandemic hit, the UK was already struggling um, at around 1.6. Some, some people say a little bit less, but let's just call 1.6 to 2% below that number. Um, Germany, Q4 of 2019, posted 0% growth. 
um, essentially since the 2008 financial crisis, and um, Lord King will, will talk more, I'm sure, uh, and more eloquently here, we really have seen growth struggle. And again, before the pandemic hit, we were already, as economists and policymakers, worried about a trend line that was declining. In fact, equity returns were readjusted downwards, and the mood music was already pretty bad. Um, you know, I myself had actually written um, in 2018 a book called Age, Edge of Chaos, talking specifically about an enormous array of head, headwinds, many of them you'll be familiar with. We were worried about technology and the risk of a jobless underclass. We were worried about demographic shifts. Um, the global population is growing very rapidly. India is adding one million people a month to the population, a million a month. We were worried about inequality, uh, not just income inequality, but inequality of access to education, health care, um, and, uh, and, and also to opportunity. Uh, we were already worried about climate change, um, and we can, I can get into uh, a lot of detail on what those risks are, but I know people are familiar with that. Um, and we were worried about the, just the sheer amount of debt um, that the world was carrying, and specifically the UK was carrying before the pandemic hit. And um, again, just for the wonks in the room, um, productivity has something that we've been talking about as, as economists, certainly, um, was already trending downwards. So um, why am I telling you this? Because in essence, the pandemic has catalyzed a lot of the problems that I've just outlined. Um, we are uh, more worried, I would argue, about inequality. Obviously, the pandemic has revealed those issues. We're more worried about uh, technology and the risk of a jobless underclass with automation. Um, we, are, we are certainly worried about climate. Um, and, uh, you know, emissions did not go down. We've all been sitting at home for over 12 months, and emissions have actually gone up by a lot of estimates. Um, and demographic problems continue to, to abound. Um, so what does that mean for where we are now? And you don't have to believe me. Go and have a look at the IMF and World, World Bank forecasts for 2022-23 um, that the world is basically uh, once again trending downwards in terms of growth, uh, growth forecasts. Um, I'm desperately worried. Um, I'm worried because I do think that we are in um, a, a, a cycle where policy and politicians very naturally reach for short-term solutions, things that do attract votes in the here and now, but perhaps don't really address the structural changes that are needed to sort of jumpstart uh, education. It's just not sexy, it's not palatable. Things like rethinking about education, really tackling some of the fundamental um, issues that were highlighted around uh, immigration um, and, and talent, investment in talent. So um, essentially, I think that where the UK is right now, it's not a unique situation. It is a global problem. Um, and, and as I said, I think just in terms of separating tactics here and now versus more, ter more long-term problems, um, I, I do worry that a lot of the conversations about what's happening now, but we're not really doing enough about structural change. And I think that leaves us quite uncompetitive against the Chinas uh, of this world and other places around the world. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I think it's very, very useful to have that, that broader sort of palette to inform us. Uh, Lord King, Melvin King, uh, you've been there at the, the heart of things and the really decisions that must be very pressing and still kind of stressful to think about when we look back to the financial crisis. And yet I think of you as a kind of sunnier soul than many of your counterparts in the, the world of, of uh, central bankers and strategists looking at economies. You were a bit more upbeat than many about uh, Brexit and, and the UK's options after Brexit. Have you still got that smile on your face? It's very dangerous, Anne, to describe central bankers as sunnier souls. <laughs> <coughs> central bankers are people who know that to every silver lining is attached a cloud. <laughs> and so I, I'll balance it. Right? There are some reasons for optimism, but I'm very pleased that Dambiza has put this into a global perspective. Almost all the problems that we face in the UK economy, including the rise in inflation, you can see in other countries as well. And much of it does stem from a decade of very slow growth after the financial crisis. There are many possible reasons for that. <clears throat> but let me start by observing that you know, language matters here. And I think that the economics profession has done an Ill, Ill service to the political debate on economic change by continuing to talk in terms of by how much has GDP declined, what's the growth rate of GDP this quarter or this year, as if there was a standard set of events that would 
hit us from time to time, some positive, some negative. And that's a very narrow way of looking at the problem. So this session entitled Operation Phoenix, the reason why I don't like that is that in terms of rising from the ashes, actually we've already risen from the ashes a very long way. Mm. The total output is actually back to not that far off where it was in 2019. But that isn't really the issue. And there are two points I'd like to make, both of which I think echo what Dampisa said. The first is that we're not in a conventional business cycle. So when you hear economists on the radio saying, we think GDP is going to grow by the fastest rate you know, for 100 years or something in the second half of the year, that strikes me as a completely meaningless statement. The, we didn't have a business cycle downturn of the normal kind last year. It wasn't that people lost confidence and stopped spending. It's that in order to protect their health, and the government then imposed measures which prevented them from going to work or operating in certain sectors of the economy. Essentially, we shut down parts of the economy for a period. And you can see that all estimates of the demand in the economy and the supply potential of the economy fell very sharply together, then rose, then fell again over the 2021 winter and are now beginning to come back. None of this is a picture that calls for traditional standard monetary stimulus or indeed fiscal stimulus. This is a unique situation and we have to think our way through it. The second point I'd make, and this echoes very much what Dan Beza said, is that as we come <coughs> out of COVID-19, which we hope we will slowly, then I think the big theme will not be trying to forecast GDP growth, after all, the people who do, it's bizarre that people still try and do it because just <clears> cast your mind back to the 1st of January 2020. Lots of economists published forecasts for the growth of the British and world economies in 2020, 2021. Within a few weeks, they all had to be completely torn up because something happened that people hadn't anticipated. But things are always happening that people can't easily anticipate. And so it doesn't make sense to pin your policy on the basis of some arbitrary short-term forecast. As we come out of COVID-19, what we are seeing is, I think, something... I think Dambisa's phrase was, um, the problems of COVID have crystallised or exacerbated the problems that we were seeing before. And that's exactly right. So the, this is Ian's point, too, that the structure of the economy is going to have to change. That's the big issue for the next few years. The structure of spending and output as we come out of COVID-19 will be very different. Who knows how big the airline industry will be in five years' time? People can make forecasts, but we don't know. But we'll learn about that. We know that businesses will put a lot more focus on resilience than they did before. The strange thing is that during the financial crisis, what we learned was that a banking system that's very efficient and profitable is not necessarily one that's going to survive an unusual shock. And the ability to survive is just as important as the ability to be efficient. That, that was the lesson of the Irish potato famine in the 19th century. You need diversity, you need backup sources. So I think resilience will mean a change to the structure of spending. Then you talked about Boris wanting to spend a lot more money. Well, he's not going to have that many opponents in the political world. People are always coming up with lots of good ideas for more public spending. That too is going to imply a different structure to our economy. There's been a need ever since the financial crisis, indeed I would argue from before the financial crisis, to rebalance not just the British economy but most of the big economies around the world, some of which were saving too much, some of which were saving too little. The UK was saving too little. Combating climate change, that's bound to mean changes to the structure of the economy. And last, as interest rates start to rise, we are going to see, not just in Britain but around the world, so-called zombie companies, companies that could service their debts when interest rates were very low, even though they had no prospect of repaying the principal of the loans, now starting to recognise, actually, that they have to restructure their debts 
That will have implications for the lenders and the banking system. But it has a great potential benefit, which is if only now we can move to a point where we can release resources from those sectors and companies where they've been trapped earning very low rates of return in the last decade and shift those resources of people and finance into companies and sectors where returns are much higher, then we'll see faster productivity growth, higher growth of the economy, and a much brighter future. So that's the, th those are my two big points. Don't get captured by the traditional language of, gosh, there seems to be a downturn in the economy. We better ease fiscal policy or have lots of monetary stimulus. Uh, and don't get captured by the idea that we should only focus on GDP and aggregate. We need to reallocate resources within our economy, and that's going to be the basis for faster growth in the future. Thank you very much. Um, so, certainly back to you on that, Ian. No zombie companies in your portfolio, I hope. Uh, hopefully not, but I, I do see some issues that are related to, uh, to growth, and I, I totally take on your point that GDP is a fairly arbitrary measure. Mm -hmm. But I look at my businesses and I think, well, how do we grow our businesses in the future? I see huge uh, inflation in, in wage, wages and, and, and goods and services that we receive. But if we don't get growth on the top line in our business, then we have a problem. And, and I think the same thing applies to many other companies. Where is the growth coming from? And right now, I'm not sure. And, and I think, in, in generality, if I look at the, the country from a, a real estate perspective, which is kind of what I do every day, and, and I look at where we need to, to make changes, you know, I, I see a, a, a massive lack of um, engagement with city centers. I see a huge hollowing out of city centers, both in terms of, uh, you know, the, the retail sectors had a sort of Armageddon, really. The shops closing everywhere without really any strategic plan of what to do in city centers. That's going to lead to social unrest, social cohesion problems. So I think we need a, a government task force to deal with city centers, the future of the city center. What does it look like? We all know that our retail offering will shrink, but what do we do with the space? How do we reallocate, reuse that space? I think that's, that's, a, that's a huge thing. Uh, the other thing is that we really do have a broken planning system in this country. We know we need new homes. The local authorities are not always competent to do it. They, they have arbitrary plans that, that they're not really workable, and I think central government needs to streamline the planning process and take control where people are not delivering. Can I just be a bit cheeky and say, look, a big property developer, real estate person wants to kind of liberalise planning laws. Not, not, not an unusual... Mm. No, um, absolutely. Funny that. Um, <laughs> and obviously, you know, you, your views are not only uh, about the no. bottom line in this. You, as you've made clear, they're, they're yeah. about uh, what you think should happen to mm. revivify uh, towns and, yeah. and cities. But, but do, you, do you understand why that is such a divisive issue, even among those who would consider themselves, particularly in the Conservative Party or in the, in the governing party, as it is at, at the moment, you know, that there is always that tension sure. between uh, liberalisation and just basically just like buggering up the country, really? I understand that. And, I th and first of all, I don't build any housing, so I've, I've got no, no dog in that, uh, mm. in that race. But um, so we don't build housing. I'm looking at city centres in terms of just general, really, what, what it means to the community and what it means in terms of housing and, and better places for people to live. And I think that we have to be clever about it. I think we have to reuse urban spaces better. We need to build better towns. We need to build more ecologically sustainable communities. Um, and there are places to do that without destroying our green belt. There's lots of brown belt land around cities which needs to be properly allocated. But I can give you, you know, a personal example. We, we had in our portfolio some green land, which, sorry, it wasn't green land. It was, it was land which was um, consented for industrial development. Um, we decided not to build the industrial use on it, and it was therefore allocated to be housing. This was in Hertfordshire. And seven and a half years later, we still haven't got our planning consent because it needed all sorts of regional reviews and local <coughs> reviews and then planning fights and one thing and another. And I think maybe by the 
eighth anniversary of our first application, we'll get permission. It's 300 homes on a site that was already listed for industrial development. It doesn't sound complicated to me to change that to residential, but apparently it is. So there you go. That's a great example, then, Lisa, of the, the way that you start out looking at the big picture and wanting to figure out how we can come faster uh, out of, of the doldrums, that only to, to find, as Ian said earlier, that the, the, the promises of getting rid of red tape do seem to have a habit uh, of producing uh, yet more of that valuable commodity. Where do you see the priorities? I mean, you, you're also, you sit on a, a number of, of boards as well as, as writing uh, about boards. Where do you see the priorities then for companies? What should they be asking for? Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about the role of government here, but uh, are we, are companies themselves clear enough about their mission after the pandemic? And I think you're a mind reader, because that's what I, I want to make sure that people don't lose the will to live um, after this panel. <laughs> um, so um, perhaps what, what I might do is just give some specific Please. examples of Please where do. I think that, you know, real progress can be made. There's no doubt about it, um, and I think both my co-panelists have, have made it clear, we actually do need a, um, a very clear, um, I would say quite aggressive plan, given the structural changes that we're facing. Um, but I think also it's going to cost a lot of money. So um, you're right, I serve on the boards of a number of large global uh, corporations, and I know that they, these companies are struggling to actually put money to work, um, whether they are in energy or banking, consumer goods, um, and which seems a bit of an oddity. The world's population is growing, um, and here they are actually preferring to pay dividends and share buybacks back to shareholders mm -hmm. instead of taking that money as retained earnings and investing in the economy. So that worries me a lot. That means they're not seeing, or they are seeing, that growth is not, uh, there's not a compelling story for them to put money to work. And I'll come back to that in a minute because I think climate is, is on in everyone's mind. So maybe I'll put some numbers there just to, to give um, a bit more color on that. Um, but you know, one thing that I think that they could do, um, in the US, they are exploring something called opportunity zones, which I'm, I think is quite an interesting suggestion. Um, and just to be absolutely clear, I'm not a big bureaucrat. I tend to find that governments do get in the way. But I do think that corporations are desperately looking for leadership to jumpstart. I mean, this is a, an industrial, almost a, at the industrial revolution type of innovations um, and policies that we need. Um, and so therefore, companies can do it on their own. But the opportunity zones, uh, just to be very specific, um, is this idea where, uh, you know, shorthand, there's about $30 trillion uh, locked in the stock markets because a lot of investors um, don't want to liquidate the stock positions, even at these highs, because they don't want to face the taxes, um, capital gains taxes. So what has come up is this idea that, um, that you get a sort of, you get grandfathered, you can take the money out of the stock market, um, and invest it in the sorts of projects that Ian is talking about. And for some percentage of time, you don't have to pay taxes, or if you pay taxes, it's at a lower rate. I mean, that to me is the sort of ingenuity we need. That will not only solve the problem of unlocking capital, Absolutely. but it also um, has government really saying, hey, listen, I don't want you to just go and buy a nice new yacht. I want you to take that capital and invest it in these opportunity zones. And I think that is an exa a specific example of what I'd love to see more of. Um, but just to come back to climate, if I may, for a moment, just to illustrate the problem. So we are um, globally consuming 100 million barrels of oil every single day. Um, there are about a billion and a half people around the world who don't have access to energy um, in a sustainable way. I'm, I'm a, I actually was born and raised in Africa. Um, it, Africa is a, a, a great example of this. Um, lots of uh, people, not just in Africa, but around the, the world, don't have access to energy. Um, I, don't, I have not been in any room, public policy or um, uh, corporate rooms or even in endowment, I'm on the Oxford University's endowment um, investment committee, where people aren't subscribed to a low carbon future. But in order to get there, we need not just risk mitigation, you know, where people are just saying, oh my gosh, the sky is falling down, let's just focus on uh, net zero and emissions. Critically important, we have to deal with the risks, but we do also need clear pathways for investment. Investment in solar and wind, geothermal, biofuels, nuclear gen four, I mean, the list is quite endless um, of, of opportunities to, to take flyers and in innovation to solve this problem. We cannot risk mitigate our way out of this problem. And, and just to, I'll close here by saying that the reason I tried to give this example 
is because we need government to step up and make sure that the environment enables private sector, not just to Absolutely. invest in research where there could be big losses, right, just hit or miss, but also in development. And I fear that there's a lot of the, the frame, specifically about uh, climate, but also in other areas, is very glass half empty. We got to solve this, we, but we cannot shrink our way to, to the future. And, I, and in that respect, I think government is going to be really important as setting the narrative for, for private sector money to come in. Bevan, I'm going to bring us back, thank you very much, Anvisa. Uh, I'm going to bring us back to the UK before perhaps go out to the audience for some questions because I can just feel them sort of thrumming on the undergrowth and I think that this is a subject that is, is going to get some very good questions. So I'm going to give us a bit longer uh, for that in, in this session. I have to mention the B word, the Brexit word, because I think it's still, it is like it's still sort of there in, underneath the, the debate. And a, a lot of people have either decided that they've sort of come to peace with what happened in 2016, whichever side they were on. And yet there, there's a sense that perhaps since we regrouped from the back end of this year, the supply chain problems became clearer, uh, the labour market issues, uh, immigration question reared its head again that uh, Ian uh, referred to and said very strongly what his position was at the beginning, that he, you know, that he felt that uh, Brexit, Schmexit, it is something still had to be done to, to bring more people into the country to fill those gaps in the labour market. Now, you, you kind of counter-joked uh, with me when I, I said uh, central, central bankers could occasionally be sunny, and I thought you were. Are you still as, shall we say, not if not sunny, then broadly optimistic that Brexit is not as big a disruptor to the UK economy as critics would claim? So the position I took after the Brexit referendum is one that I still subscribe to, which was that in the long run, I saw no reason to suppose that Brexit would be a major impact on the UK economy in either direction. You know, both the optimistic mm. view that Brexit would mm. enable us to be liberated and free, mm. or that the you know, consequence of Brexit would be that our growth rate would decline rapidly. And I took that view because I don't think there was any evidence that joining the then common market actually led to a transformation of the British economy in either direction. So. And I, and I couldn't see that the underlying arguments that w were put forward actually added up to very much because almost all the economic studies that were published, including I regret by the government, were based on rather arbitrary comparisons with economists that, economies that had been in centrally planned economies that were totally different from a developed market economy reorganising its trade and political relationships with um, you know, a major trading partner. I did think that if carefully prepared and managed, there needn't be significant immediate disruption effects. I don't think we did prepare for it at all sensibly and properly. I mean, I think it's quite disgraceful that the government took the position that they were not prepared to spend any money or time and effort preparing to leave without a deal, thus undermining their own negotiating position and that we ended up uh, essentially signing a protocol on Northern Ireland, which the government had no intention of honouring. I mean, these are really basic errors in, in managing a government. But, you know, we'll get through this. The, the shortages of lorry drivers and others, mm. you can see all around the world. This is not just a UK phenomenon. And the question about what we should do on immigration now is really not as such an issue to do with Brexit. We have the freedom now to decide what our own policy is Absolutely. on immigration. Ian would like to see, I think as many business people would, the ability to recruit people freely from overseas. I think the cost of that is that what we've seen is that if it is possible to recruit well-educated, highly motivated people with a strong work ethic to come and work in the UK, then some people benefit from that, but people at the bottom of the income distribution in the UK do not. And what we're going to see now, I suspect, is quite a significant rise in the wages of people at the bottom. That won't lead to a higher productivity on their part in the short run at all. It will lead to higher inflation. Mm -hmm. 
um, and that's going to be a challenge. But that's a political judgment. And whichever path you take on immigration is not the result of Brexit. You have a choice now, which we didn't really have before. So I think that's what I would say about Brexit. But the idea that you know, the Brexit is, is the factor that's driving the British economy, I think, is, is an exaggeration. I'll just get uh, quick thoughts, perhaps, for the other two panellists on that. Bre Brexit, the troll under the bridge <laughs> sitting there creating more problems or exacerbating problems for the British uh, economy, uh, Dan Visa, or as Mervyn suggests, something that could have been handled better but is uh, perhaps not as much of a, a driver of, of events as is often claimed. What's, where do you come I, out I on that? I think I'd probably be a, a little bit more crude um, than, uh, than Lord King and just say that, you know, who cares at this point? It is what it is. It's embedded. And I mean, even if I said to you, oh, yes, it's absolutely mm -hmm. the reason for the shortages, which mm -hmm. I don't believe because, as you rightly pointed out, everywhere there are global shortages um, and uh, in supply chains, etc. Um, I just don't see what relevance it is, except to sort of create greater fissures. I think the key takeaway that both Ian and uh, Lord King have, have um, underscored is government still needs to act with the hand that we have now. And there are the degrees of freedom. Um, and there is a lot of latitude in which government can do. And in fact, if anything, maybe on the margin, they have more latitude because they aren't part of the, the EU. So I would not worry and navel gaze about Brexit. Should it have happened? Did it not? Why did it happen, et cetera? That's immaterial. The point of the matter is we've got low growth, a risk of inflation. We've got climate action issues. The IEA is asking for $5 trillion, worth less than half of that that we're earmarking towards climate initiatives. We've got inequality. We can come up with a proposal, a joined up plan, um, to, to address these issues in the short term as well as the long term. Yeah. I totally agree. I don't think that Brexit in the long term will make that much difference to our economy, uh, provided that we have a plan. And right now I don't see one. And, and it, as I said right at the beginning, the government has to engage with the private sector and they're not doing it. So your That's immigration point, it, to one, there is, you know, the, the linkage is the politics, isn't it? Because yeah. I suspect that the reason that the government isn't kind of saying, all right, let's give mm. in Livingston and, uh, and others, you know, the, you're not the only voice in British no, no, business no. asking for this, is there is, a, a, if a driver of the Brexit decision was clamping down on sure. immigration, then it is, it is just politically harder is. for a I, government to, to say, well, we can sort of, what, we, what we voted for was not necessarily clamping down on immigration, it was control of immigration. Fair so point. it was, it was the government being able to say what we needed, who we needed, for what jobs and when. So I think that's the first point. And the second point is, it's not just about immigration, it's about having industrial strategy for the country going forward, and I don't know what that is. Right, let's get some uh, questions, thoughts, challenges. I'll start at the front with the lady here. And uh, then we'll, we'll go to the, the gentleman behind. We might take, there's a lot of questions already. Oh, you're all up early and bright this morning. There's about three or four here. So why don't we take two questions to start with? Okay. We'll uh, take the two together. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the panel. So in my day job, um, I actually run the board practice for a large financial institution. So I, I look forward to, uh, to reading your book. But a few weeks ago, for my sins, I uh, enrolled in a, in a research master's at your alma mater. And we had a residential workshop where we had an entire day on degrowth, <laughs> which I had never heard of. I'm a libertarian-leaning economist. I was last at university a very long time ago. And I was like, what is this nonsense, right? And I sort of, and I sort of listened and listened and listened. And it seemed to come down to a criticism of two things. One thing which you talked about, which is GDP and the measure of growth and what that is. And then also a completely confused misunderstanding of economics and how that drives things. But it also is becoming very embedded, I think, in this idea, particularly around climate change, which is the specific area that we were looking at. And it really worries me. But how do we speak to people who maybe don't necessarily have an economics background and don't understand or don't work in business and understand, you know, thinking how do you actually have that conversation when we're almost out of, you know, out of, out of sync, certainly with, with younger generations? Um, that's the first question. The second question I, I had... Thank you, Curtis. Oh, okay. Just get another question. Okay, in sure. It. Sorry. No, 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 you can finish. Please finish. Oh, oh no, it was just... We heard from Katie yesterday about, uh, you know, the vaccine programme and how well that worked, working government and business. Is that a model going forward? Interesting. Okay, I'll take the gentleman there as well, and then the panel can decide which they're best mm. equipped to, to answer. Thank you. Taking a look at 
longer term secular uh, developments in the UK, it seems to me that on a relative basis, things are going in the wrong direction. GDP per capita, performance of financial markets, UK versus others, things such as life expectancy, relative patient outcomes from the health service relative to other countries, uh, and financial markets have cast their verdict on this. At the same time, this has been accompanied by an unprecedented, and some would say malign, expansion of a UK state. Um, does the law of unintended consequences, when government gets involved, uh, is that responsible for um, these adverse developments? Mervyn, do you want to pick that up? Uh, well, I mean, certainly pick up any of those questions that we heard, but well, uh, there was a reference there to GDP, up, and I thought you might want to, to challenge that. that. Um, I think it's, I don't think generalization about the relative position of the UK and the rest of the world is, is easy. I mean, you mentioned life expectancy. Relative to the United States, we've done much better in terms of life expectancy in recent years. They are the country that have had the deaths of despair in which low-income families have seen their life expectancy fall quite sharply. Now, that's beginning to be observable in the UK, clearly all around the world. COVID is going to affect that. But I think it's just not true that everything in Britain is getting worse relative to the rest of the world. You know, it, it, we, we have a great tradition in Britain of being balanced and accusing ourselves of great failures. But I am a great believer in the law of unintended consequences, absolutely. And I think that many policies that governments put in place have the problem that people don't think through the consequences of what might be the policies down the road. I saw that in the financial crisis where people wanted to do things and I could see the problems that would result if we were to do that. So uh, taking one's time to think through the consequences of policies is very important. And, uh, and that is why, you know, I'm sure Dan Beza will talk in a minute about climate change and this, this so-called degrowth idea. But the idea that a prime minister should come out and talk in rather flippant terms about, you know, by 2050, we'll all be driving around electrical vehicles, and as if nothing will happen. There are no adverse consequences of any of these changes is a big mistake. And I'll identify one big problem that I am worried about in the next five to 10 years. I talked about the need to reallocate resources within the economy. And Ian and, and Dumbiza have talked about the need to expand production and investment in some parts of the economy and contract it in other parts. That's very important. But for that to happen, the prices of goods and services produced in the new sectors will have to rise relative to those in the old sectors. And the wages of people that we want to move into the new sectors will rise. And the difficulty with that is that unless you can push down the prices or push down the wages of people in the declining sectors, then what you see is a rise in average inflation as you reallocate resources within the economy. So I think the big challenge for policy in the next decade is going to be to try to reconcile quite large shifts in the structure of our economy with the wish to maintain inflation at a low and stable level. Dambisa, can I uh, turn to you? Maybe you could take on the, the degrowth question. I'm yeah. pleased that that came up. I'm sure it is, it is the, the latest subject, really, yeah. probably sort of uh, yeah. dividing the debate. You know, I have a relatively young team as part of uh, what I run at The Economist, you know, half of whom are asking for why aren't we doing more on degrowth, and the other half are just saying, well, because it's batshit. So, uh, <laughs> so help us, help us out, help us under our question to manage this contradiction. Yeah. So um, I, I think I mentioned already, I was, uh, I mean, if I haven't, I'm, maybe I'm repeating myself, but um, I was born and raised in Africa and you know, in one of the poorest countries in the world. And so I'm framed a lot by that. And, uh, and, and I think it's really important because I do think that the, the advocates of degrowth um, tend to be people who are living in societies that have grown and they you know, have the, actually the opportunity to even talk about degrowth. Um, and I, I, I worry desperately about this. I think part of the risks to big um, negative externalities and discussions around 
global public goods like a climate change, um, like I would argue digitization in many ways is that I mean, we're seeing the schisms emerging. I mean, COP26, pick up the newspaper. We are, we are creating um, a split in conversations between Western developed economies um, and um, emerging economies. And, and you know, I, I'm not in the government. I don't know exactly if this is true, but COP26 is coming up next week, and many of the large emerging economies are now saying they won't even bother coming to the event. I think that's because there is this sense that, um, that the issues of growth and improvements in living standards that are really critically important in the emerging world, where 90% of the world's population leave, uh, live, are being um, are essentially being asked, we're asked to put them to, to the side. I don't engage uh, in with degrowth type of arguments because um, I don't think we should be trying to degrowth or focus on degrowth. I think we should try to improve and enhance the manner in which growth is delivered. Um, and and I think again, uh, Lord King has, has sort of intimated in his remarks, we can. I do believe we can do growth better. Um, but I think to throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater is not a place where we can, where we should be seeking to land. Um, there's second order consequences around disorderly migration, geopolitical risk, conflict not just between countries but within countries, populism. I mean, I think are really um, artifacts of a, an environment in which degrowth has captured um, the, the narrative. And, and I think I mentioned also that you know the, it, this has been going on for 10 years. I would argue that the real marker was the battle in Seattle World Trade Organization meetings in 1999. I mean, since then, there has been a relentless assault against growth, against, against capitalism, against corporations. Um, and I, I fear that people just don't have the understanding of uh, what is at risk if the world economy shrink. Um, and, uh, and, and as a consequence, um, uh, I worry a lot about that um, and, and how that could affect us in terms of allocating resources and, and providing uh, future opportunities for the next generation. So, Ian, I can't quite see you in a degrowth t-shirt, but, no, no, exactly. but, uh, you know, but it, it is a, a challenge, a sort of systemic challenge in a, in a view perhaps not only at the, the edges of, of academia, but that there's something fundamentally wrong uh, with the capitalist system, that companies are in some ways, I was just running around the other day, and a question just comes up, are companies responsible you know, for the world's woes? Sort of, and, and just, it, it doesn't go away. Now, I know this is, it, it, electorally, we've seen the end of the, the, the Corbyn bid in Britain, but we, you know, the government coming in in Germany, where there was a, the, the party likely to, to emerge as the, with the chancellery has a very active left wing. A lot of positions are not a million miles away from the kind of degrowth uh, argument there that, that Dambisa was taking on. Does it concern you that we, we have a less understanding of capitalism? I'm, I'm not a you know, macroeconomist, and, and what I see is the way that businesses behave. And, and, and I look at the businesses that we've got in this country, and we've got world-leading businesses here. We've got, we've got businesses which you may or may not like, like BP and Shell, <coughs> who were fossil fuel companies who can change and, and, and will be instrumental in, 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 in change going forward because they're big companies with, with lots and lots of um, you know, intelligent people there, lots of you know, great technology that they're working on. And so I think our world-leading companies need to have a context for growing internationally. And, and, and what I don't see at the moment is how the government engages with that. It's also in part an answer to the, the gentleman's question there about our relative position. And with, uh, may, may I just add a yeah, little bit more? Because I think the point about unintended consequences is really important. There are things that we're doing right now that have um, longer term consequences if, if we don't think about them holistically. So I'll give an example of um, uh, diversity, if I may. Um, and I think that you know, most people, most sensible people can make not just a, a mo emotional argument for why diversity matters, um, but also an economic and financial uh, argument. And you can look at return on invested capital. You can look at how much uh, returns on equity above cost of capital you can generate from di being, having more diverse boards, more diverse workforce, et cetera. But from the perspective of decision makers, we can't be in a world where um, we're fighting discrimination with discrimination. That doesn't work either. I mean, we can't, I, you know, and I, I campaign quite 
um, sort of vocally in my boardrooms that we don't want to alienate the white guy because you know he didn't do any, he in particular didn't do anything wrong. But now we're sending a signal that you know we only promote women or minority groups, and that's also not an equilibrium that we want. But th th that's just one example of a whole list of other things that we do in the short term. As I mentioned earlier, focusing on the downside risk without thinking about upside investment in climate change. Thinking about um, today's diverse workforces without thinking about the fact that digitization will, will likely undermine those efforts because a lot of people who are getting hired, um, unfortunately, are low-skilled workers and they're the first ones to go. So there are a lot of these more structural things we need to think about. Sorry. Let's take a few questions from the, the back end of, of the room. Yes, I can see the, the hand in the middle. Hi. Hi. Um, are there any tools or tactics that the panel would like to see introduced to help uh, combat climate change, either from government or from business? Thank you. We'll just uh, hold thoughts on that panel, get another question. I've got a gentleman in front of me here. Is there anyone at the back? I promise I'll come back to you, sir. Um, I just we're aware that if you're in the, uh, the back end, I might not see you. Okay, well, if uh, the mic could go along to this gentleman, we'll take a second one here. Thank you. Yeah, my question, I guess, gets back to the, the idea of, of, of the UK and the Phoenix. I mean, I work in the biotech sector and work in the you know, development of mRNA therapeutics, which have proven so successful in terms of vaccine development. The issue we face is that the capital markets in, don't seem to work very efficiently because there's an inexorable stream of companies going off to the US. Mm. And what happens there is that all the jobs get transferred to the US and they benefit. And this happens um, a lot you in, mean in our industry. You mean in the UK originally? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of future investment, investment in new technologies, which I think everyone agrees is, is really important for recreating the, the economy, how do we create that environment that investors are willing to invest in these sort of companies and that we get efficient capital markets? Yeah, would you like to take that I one? And it's been my, my two big answers to that are enterprise zones and capital allowances and the government has to back certain industries and we have to make it easy to take money out of the stock market in an efficient way and invest in these higher growth areas but this needs a concerted effort by the government to to, to figure out the way of doing it uh, would you like to pick up on that and then maybe you could take the uh tools and tactics for climate change as yeah, well. Yeah, so maybe I'll go to the tactic, tools and tactics on climate change. And um, perhaps this is a, a slight benefit of being um, outside of the European Union. I think, by and large, the, the if I, I'm using shorthand in the interest of time, but the European approach to these large global uh, externality, public goods problems is more regulation. I would say, I'm using shorthand here. Um, uh, and I find that a, it's very rules-based. It's very much, this is how we, we government is going to go in and attack the problem. The, the scale of the problem of climate change cannot be addressed by policy alone. If we really want to get to net zero by 2050, which is what the UK has targeted, China's targeting 2060, and there are a bunch of others, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the West, Denmark, France, et cetera, that have also got 2050 targets. It's impossible to do that without technology. It just is. Um, and, you know, we, I, again, I'm happy to go through the numbers I, that I mentioned earlier. A billion people, um, no access to energy. That creates disorderly migration. Geopolitical fissures between developed and developing countries. The risk focus is not going to get us there. So the specific things that I would look to government to do, um, given the fact that we don't have an answer, I, and I like to say we are 8 billion people on the planet, if somebody knew how to create clean energy on a sustainable, scalable basis, we'd have the answer. We, we live in creative destruction. Everybody's desperate for this answer. There's a whole energy stack that companies are trying out, the, the BP shells, et cetera, and it's just not scalable or there are other constraints in terms of cost. So what are the things I think about doing? Government taking risk, the first uh, risk loss positions, understanding that we're going to have to invest some money and it may not land. I mean, this goes back to the, the gentleman's comment about life sciences and biotech. We have to take those punts. We have to encourage people to do that. That's how we got the, uh, the vaccine at, at Oxford. Um, I think also making sure that, um, we, especially the endowments uh, in, in places like where the pockets of money are, pensions, endowments in this country don't, they, they need to understand more this, the long-term point. I worry a lot 
that you have the Church of England and others, and I'm sorry, it's Sunday, I don't want to criticize the church, but I do think that they take very political positions without understanding that something of climate change is a transition. It's not a jump from one equilibrium to another. It is a transition. It's going to be extremely hairy, extremely complicated, and we need to bring everyone along. And I worry a lot that that narrative, uh, as a specific point, is not being um, sort of packaged and delivered. Thank you. Um, Mervyn, to the, the, the gentleman's point about company flight, and also perhaps if you could just uh, include in your answers just a word about the stock exchange, which is the London Stock Exchange, a little pride of the city in, in many ways, and a great advert for UK PLC, but not doing that well at the moment relative, in term, relatively in terms of, uh, of listings. Are we seeing just a big shift, as the, the question seemed to suggest? You've seen a lot of people who are innovative, who are founders, who are growing companies, and then basically going somewhere else. Well, just one brief comment on that. This is a very old problem. It's not a new one. Back in the 1930s, governments worried about it. And it's a difficult question to solve because the basic problem is, I got a terrific idea, and you've got the money. And how do you know that my idea is worth your money investing in it? And there's no easy answer to that. The Americans have clearly, for a long time, for various reasons, been more adept at encouraging new companies, particularly in the, based on technical innovations. But we've done better than much of Europe. Uh, so the, you know, we're somewhere in between. And I don't think there is any simple answer. I think Dambiza's answer was exactly the right one, uh, which is you know, governments have to find ways to encourage investment in areas where they feel there could be enormous payoffs to the rest of society from success, climate change being the obvious one. I think we can get in the last couple of questions and then the panel can also use their answers to give us their final thoughts. I've got a gentleman here. Is there anyone, any ladies at the back of the room who are just shy but bursting to ask a question and will say afterwards that they should have done? I think I can see a mic going over there. Thank you. <laughs> I have literally no idea where it's going to end up. It's <laughs> radical uncertainty. <laughs> if you've got a microphone, please speak. I've got you, sir. I just would like to take the other... Would you like to go first, then we'll take the other one. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for an excellent alternative to Andrew Marr this morning. <laughs> um, Ian, you mentioned about the heroin of government expenditure in the last 12 months. Uh, for the last 12 years, we've also had the crack cocaine of low interest rates. And with personal, government, and corporate debt at probably all-time highs, and with rising inflation, and with the traditional way of dealing with high inflation, of raising interest rates, do you think there is an alternative? Are you happy to just hold a second and we'll get another the question? If the microphone at the back landed yeah. with someone, I'd like to hear from you. Um, hi. Hiya. So, um, so there's like no denying that the economy has been like quite severely damaged. I mean, not only by COVID, but also from austerity. Um, so given the problems that we do currently face with the economy, how do you think, what do you think the government right now can actually do to help kind of to rectify the damages to the lives of this quite severely marginalized groups in society today? Uh, don't be so much start with you. OK, so um, I, I'm going to draw on somebody else, uh, somebody else's comment, which I think is actually brilliant. This is uh, Mike Bloomberg, who was the mayor of New York um, for three, um, three terms. And he said, um, basically, government can do four things. Number one, be data driven. Number two, be forward leaning. Number three, focus on measured outcomes. And number four, don't be corrupt. Um, and, and the thing is, it seems quite like a simple thing, but um, he, he did emphasize that actually, even if somebody comes to you with a proposal that seems completely wayward, just completely crazy, if, if they have shown that they've used those four parameters, they're worth taking a punt on. And I think that that's exactly right. We need government to focus on data. Let's look at the numbers. The numbers don't lie. This is the situation. And I think it helps us design policy much better. We've got to be forward leaning. We cannot be in the sort of here and now, let's, you know, let's pander to voters because we want to win elections. Unfortunately, that is a natural artifact of the, uh, of the democratic process. It's created this massive schism between short-term imperatives and politics. 
versus the long-term problems that we've talked about here. We need to really get government to think long-term. And I can talk to you, I have 10 proposals, I won't talk about them here, but there, there are specific things that we can do better. Um, measured outcomes, I mean, it seems like a crazy thing, but how about just measuring what we do in a much more active way? Um, we don't do that, and then, then just don't be corrupt. I mean, I'm just sick and tired of picking up the paper and reading Panama Papers or this and that. I mean, especially for somebody from Africa, seeing this in the West, um, the corruption of, of governments um, in Europe and, and elsewhere is just, uh, it's an indictment on, on humanity and society. So there are four specific things I would say government can do. Ian. Um, training, better education, training and skills. Uh, and, and again, as I keep saying, engaging with the private sector, finding out what skills are required, putting in place the building blocks for better education, and better skilled workforce going forward. So Your recipe. Just two points to add. To, one to add to Dan Beza's list. I think it's very important not to be seduced by the idea of focusing on arbitrary numerical targets in policy. I mean, we did that in the National Health Service, and I think it's a mistake to sort of judge policy by saying, well, you know, I don't have an arbitrary date for the, the length of time for waiting lists, etc. You've got to have a system where you recognise that people employed in various jobs, whether it be teachers, doctors, others, have to use their own judgement and discretion as to the right way to behave. And if you take away that discretion and tell them that what they have to do is to meet an arbitrary externally imposed target, you lose the quality of people that you need to have in those sectors. That's the first. The second, um, avoid self-deception. So. If we do have an inflationary problem, and that's for another panel, not this, I suspect, <laughs> then the right answer is to raise interest rates. I don't think, you know, it's, it's a more complicated issue than that at present. But there is no simple alternative, and it's a mistake. And one of the things which I worry about with politicians is that they seem under enormous pressure to say that we can achieve wonderful things, but there's no pain or cost involved. And as Dambiza said, on climate change, if you really believe in it and take it seriously, you can't just wave away the problems and say we've got these tremendous targets. We're going to commit to achieving net zero by 2050 and then turn around and in the same year refuse to raise fuel duty, refuse to impose a carbon tax, and instead expect other people somehow to do things which are meant to achieve those objectives. That, doesn't, that is self-deception. Thank you very much indeed, my fantastic panel. I think we've given the Phoenix a reality check and some very sound uh, uh, advice. And we must hope that the, the Phoenix was paying attention, but also to, to you for coming and, and your uh, great questions. If you'd like to stimulate the literary economy, dot, 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 <laughs> uh, two of our panel members, of course, so Debbie, Sir, and Mervyn, uh, have books and you I'll can the meander Lord over. And show and, uh, Lord King. Yeah, yes. Uh, and and here, is our, here is our lovely, <laughs> is, our amazing is. sales team. They're coming on very well. We got them in on this team. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much indeed, and of course to, to Ian for joining the panel. Thank you. Thank you.